Chicken tenders, chicken strips, never without chocolate chips. Chewbacca knuckles, Chewbacca juice, bring them before me. Spread out goblets, plates and feast, never without Love chicken tenders. Pay piggy. Pay piggy. Don't make me go back to that nine to five. Wage cut ain't no way to be alive. Don't make me go back to nine to five. Transcendental argument Reading Wittgenstein Investigate my girl philosophically Yeah, do you know what I'm saying? I just want the money Hey Piggy Just give me one more super chat Hey Piggy Just give me one more super chance Hey Piggy Just give me one more super chance Hey Piggy Yeah just give me one Yeah, Ooh. straight up I'm simple for you, girl I want my heart, want you in my world I see you in the super chat I see you wanna go for me I see you on the OnlyFans And you got my heart in your hand 
please don't crush it, girl, understand that I'm a simp, but I'm proud, I'm a geek, but I'm proud, and I want to feel your breasts at a convention, I want my picture of you groping my ass to be on social media, I want my friends to see it on Discord, I'm gonna upload it to my subreddit, and they all gonna see it. My friends, they gonna like it, they gonna retweet it, but I bet that it's gonna be the greatest moment of my life, and I want you to be a part of it, girl, yeah. Don't make me go back to that 95. to 5. Wage ain't no way to be alive. Don't make me go back to 95. to 5. Wage ain't no way to be alive. Ooh, baby. Just give me one more super chat, hey Diggy. Just give me one more super chance, hey Diggy. Just give me one more super chance, hey Diggy. Just give me one, ooh, hey Diggy. Just give me one more super chat, hey Diggy. Just give me one more super chance, hey Diggy. Just give me one more super champ, hey Diggy. Just give me one, ooh. I can't hear ya. Let me hear you say it. Let me hear you say fuck, Klaus Schwab. Fuck, Klaus Schwab. Let me hear you say fuck. Put them into the space. Put them 
into the outer space. Kill the white people. Kill the white people, put them into space. Make this place a better place, man. Me hiding from you. Can you come and find me? Me no play I and seek on you in the space. Crazy white people like Nikola Tesla. He gonna shock you, tingle and put you in this space. Crazy white people like Nikola Tesla. Gonna put the white people up in the space. Crazy white people like Nikola Electricity. Gonna put the white people up in the space. Put the white people on the space yacht. Make them fly up into space. Put the white people on the space boat. Make them float away. Gaia become Ganja. Gonna make the world into one. Gonna big make spliff. the earth into All one big spliff. Gaia become Ganja. ganja. <laughs> Did you know all my songs are still available? You can find all them hits. Uh, how about a little techno? A little bit of techno. I feel like an Elvis stream requires a little bit of techno. We're waiting on Jamie, so. Oh no, here she comes. Maybe not. A little bit of a musical interlude while we wait. Do you remember the techno remix of Klaus? I actually like that. It's like, it's that dark Gil, that's that dark Gil Bates wave. It's a dark Gil Bates wave. Where you going get the numbers down. down. Get the numbers down. Get the numbers down. Get the numbers down. Get those numbers down. We will invade Zobate. We will invade Zobate. We will be inside the zoo. We will be inside Zobate. We will be inside the zoo. Get those summers down. 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 We will be inside Zobate. We will be inside Zobate. We will be inside Zobate. We will change the DNA. We will paint the DNA. We will change the RNA. We will change the DNA. Change. Uh, now I turn it into a Davos beat. That's a Davos beat. Davos, Davos wave. wave. Davos wave. It's a Davos wave. Do the Davos wave. It's a Davos wave. Do the Davos wave. Davos wave. Do the Davos wave. It's a Davos wave. It's a Davos wave. Do the Davos wave. Anyway, welcome everybody. See, I had to. I had to perform before it, so you were taking so much time back there, taking forever. Can you scoot this over a little bit? Scoot it over where? This way. Okay. Oh, scoot it over to where I'm out of the video, right? Yeah. So, okay. Can we scoot this over to where you're not involved? <laughs> 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 Welcome, everybody. Tonight, uh, Jamie is the star because Jamie went on an Elvis kick. Uh, we, got in, we got invited to Graceland's, and that's where I got the, well, they got me these. So I got E energy. I got a little bit of sideburn. You do remind me of Elvis a lot. Okay, I'll take that. Pretty boy. Elvis Am I a pretty attitude. boy? Am yeah. I a pretty a diva? <laughs> yeah. Elvis the first diva. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But Jamie went uh, on an Elvis deep dive, and I'm impressed. She read uh, like four or five Elvis books, like in the last week or two. <clears throat> I had a hyper fixation on Elvis. This was one of the funnest 
character studies I think I've done in a long, long time. So I was really excited to keep going. Right. Um, just because I think he's such an interesting person. She's still on a bunch of pillows, by the way. She's not <laughs> taller than me. She's not an Anunnaki, and I'm not a midget man. So I'm actually taller than her. And if you come to the event, you will find that out. Um, yeah, you went you went wild with it. I'm happy. Uh, you know all about Elvis. I don't. I didn't. I didn't know that much about Elvis. I'm not a. I uh, wasn't a huge uh, E fan. I kind of like a little bit of it now. Uh, you know, I never. I'd never been to Graceland. Uh, I'm from Tennessee, but for some reason we'd never really gone. My parents uh, were not really big Elvis fans. They were more so. I don't know, like the boomer classical rock stuff. That's what my dad liked. Journey, Boston. Um, some Brothers. of that, yeah. Doobie, my dad, he liked Doobie Brothers, The Doors, that kind of stuff. That's that's what my dad was always playing. So, I never really heard Elvis albums except for I, I've heard more from Lord Voldemort playing Elvis than anywhere else. But you know, the weird part is that we cover, you know, Hollywood and celebrities and this kind of stuff and celebrity social engineering, celebrity culture, and we've not done Elvis. Yeah. Like, how do we miss the king of this? He is, <laughs> right? I mean, he's the king of rock and roll. He merged together gospel music, right? Country music and rock and roll. Uh, fusion. F- yeah, <laughs> into a fusion. Like uh, where they where they have a, a Taco Bell and a pizza next to each other. Yeah. It's a fusion. Kentaco Hut of music. That's Elvis. Kentaco Hut. Mm-hmm. Is that a thing? Yeah. Kentaco Hut. Well, like KFC. Pizza okay. Hut and Taco Bell okay. all go together. The Kentaco Huts. I didn't know they had a name, but so, okay, I'll take that. My, Which is disgusting, but yeah. My mom loves Elvis, and so I grew up listening to his gospel records. And Chicken tenders. Sing the crawfish Chicken song. strips. Crawfish. Crawfish. See, I got them. See the size. Fresh and sweet. Stripped before, before you know your are. eyes, sweet me look. <laughs> yes, <laughs> fresh and ready to be cooked. Well, we had never <laughs> seen an Elvis movie. Of all the movies we've seen, he made like forty movies or something. Right, like but only like a couple of them are actually good movies. Right, and so we watched. I was like, all right, I'll watch one that's good. So we watched King Creole, and that one was pretty good. I was impressed. Yeah. I was impressed. Uh, so, uh, and it starts off with that song. If you've not heard Crawfish, it's actually a cool song. So my mom loves Elvis, so we took her to Graceland for her birthday. And that's where we got on our Elvis kick. And I like Elvis' uh, war room. I read with all his, of these. She read all these Elvis books and this one. And this one. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. Which one do you... Let's well, it's... Hold on. It's fitting, though, because you did uh, in-depth in your book. You did Beyonce. You did Katy Perry. Yeah. You did Britney. Yeah. You did a little bit of Jacko. Did you do Madonna? Yeah. Kinda. No. You did Lady Gaga though. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, but you, we hadn't done the like archetype of all of those, which right. is weird. And he's like one of the first rock stars that became immortalized through death. Yeah. Right. Um, right. And one of those pop idols that people. Um, Thought could do miracles. You mean people thought that or E yeah. thought that? Well, he they both did. Baby, I got goals. I can make it rain yeah. with my mind, baby. Just take me up in the Lisa Marie and I'll chem tra- I'll chem trail the skies with my mind, baby. He thought he could control the weather. He thought he could heal people by laying his hands on them. And he was always like, <laughs> I need a healing. Give me, or giving people healings. Okay. I think He's a wild. That was wild, boy. He's wild. Reading all this stuff, he is the character of the century. Okay. Almost. Okay. That's what I would say about him. He is a character. Right? I mean, I was yeah. surprised all the stuff I learned about him uh, just at Graceland and then listen to Damie do it and uh, cover all these books. And then we have a good book uh, from my publisher that actually goes pretty good into this overall story of the relationship between the establishment and the pop stars uh, from a CIA and drug perspective, which is Drugs as a Weapon Against Us, which is a really good book. I recommend this. Uh, by John Potash, again, put out by my publisher, uh, Trine Day. <clears throat> and so I'm going to go into his chapter on Elvis, which has a few tidbits that the books that uh, you did didn't have. And also, we'll give a shout out to uh, uh, Bay's Lit Analyzer, uh, our friend over on his channel. He did a deep dive into Elvis based on the big 800-page uh, book that he's read. 
So definitely check out Bay's Lit Analyzers, uh, Elvis Analysis um, on his channel. It was really good. It was insightful. Um, and we watched a bunch of documentaries, again, just to kind of, I mean, Jamie really did her homework on this one. I have to give her credit. She like she went to the next level. She went above and beyond the call of duty. I'm an Elvis stan now. Yeah. Super fan. Okay. Um, okay, well, this first one I read. You like this picture? <laughs> I love older, the, it's the 70s. I love Elvis. 70s Elvis with these kinds of glasses. Mm -hmm. These are fun. Well, he actually wore those because he had eye problems. He had glaucoma. So... Well, Elvis was not the character I thought he was after all these books. He, he He's was, a lot deeper, don't you think? You, he surprised me in many ways. Yeah. So this is going to be an interesting show. You will definitely learn something. Uh, uh, Jamie, our resident PhD in Elvis studies now, Elvis I'm sure, <laughs> will teach you something new. So uh, pick a book to start with. Okay. Also, I want to remind you guys, if you want to support the show, if you would hit like and share. Uh, and you can use the Streamlabs link to send Super Chats. <clears throat> Jamie will be able to answer all of your Elvis Sasquatch UFO related questions. And she will, we actually will be getting into some of the, the wacky stuff because she even read a, a wacky Elvis book. And I was like, come on now, Jamie, this is crazy. But then, uh, the more I heard about it, I was like, actually, this might be possible. <laughs> yes. I'm just going to start with the, uh, climax is at the end of the show. No, where... Yeah. Don't do that one first. That's the, Okay, yeah. at the end of the show, yeah. we're going to answer this question to the best of my ability. <laughs> That's the cl one of the classic boomer conspiracies, right? Yeah. Elvis didn't die. Yeah. And I, I always laughed at that, but then actually I heard the argument, so I was like, all right, there might be, an ar there might be a case for that. Okay, well, um, so this book was written by Marty Lacker, which was a childhood friend of Elvis's, and that's the author at Elvis's wedding, so Priscilla Elvis and Marty Lacker. And this book was just a a story of him. Uh, Marty was in what was called the Memphis Mafia. Which is not was, a real mafia. <laughs> no, it was just like Elvis's squad that he had around him at all times. That The entourage. Yes, his entourage. And it was made up of like extended family and childhood friends. Good old boys. And people that he just trusted and wanted to have around him Right, at all good old times. boys. Um, and so this one is not very um, sensational, but they do talk about uh, his drug use in this. So Elvis was... And this is not what I thought it was either. I thought he was just, you know, like every pop star, a junkie. That's, uh -huh. not, the, that's not what happened. No. It surprised me. He was a goody two-shoes. So Elvis grew up super poor, like destitute in Tupelo, Mississippi. That's where he was born. And, and he lived on a diet of crawfish. <laughs> and the way he, his father tells the story is that the night he was born, there was this mysterious blue light that surrounded the house and the sky. And so that's why Elvis's favorite color was blue. He sang about blue suede shoes, moody blues, blue, blue, blue. All, yes. So I got a blue Elvis shirt on right now. Blue Hawaii and all that. So that's why Elvis's favorite color is blue. Also, uh, when we went to Graceland, there's a famous clothier uh, over on Beale Street or 2nd Avenue, wherever it is in Memphis. And uh, shout out to my mom. My mom bought me an Elvis looking thing from the place that both Nick Cage and Elvis shop at. I yeah. forget the name of that store, but it's like a famous. Lansky's or something? It's sort of like Lansky's. Elf. Oh, it's like the. It's not Meyer Lansky, but it's like the. Yeah, it's Lansky. It's like the name of the mobster. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so she was like, I thought that looked like Elvis and Nicolas Cage, and so I got you that. I was like, okay. It does. <laughs> okay, I'll take that, I guess. You need to grow your hair out, like, bigger. Uh, it's pretty big, okay. I mean. Well, this is interesting. So Elvis... If it goes too big, I'll look, start looking like a Pentecostal preacher. <laughs> I don't want to look like a preacher. Elvis was a twin. And yes, didn't know this. first baby came out, um, was stillborn. Not out of Elvis. <laughs> And then they didn't know back then that she was pregnant with twins, and they thought that they just had a stillborn baby, and then here comes Elvis. Right. So he was kind of like a miracle already. Um, and so he had this mystique around him that they, he thought he was absorbed the soul of his twin brother, Jesse. Yeah. 
So Jesse Garen Presley was stillborn, and then Elvis Aaron Presley came out. And the story goes that the dad got his middle name wrong on the birth certificate, and that's why there's only one Aaron. But this is going to come back later when we talk about Elvis's gravestone. Yes, which we did go see. I, and I, I've got a couple interesting pictures from Graceland to show you guys, yeah. which you will find interesting in terms of uh, esoteric elements. So they were dirt poor. He lived in the um, the black neighborhood, and he was around all of the the music and the dancing, and so that's where he absorbed his style and his and goof, goofy dance. Pentecostal stuff. Right. So he had this fusion of Pentecostal preaching and um, what's that called? Like when they shake in the the heebie-jeebies. No. Yeah, but like. What's when they get they the shake. Holy Spirit and they shake. Not the Holy Spirit, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this is what Elvis um, is influenced by. Right. Um, Pentecostal shaking. Right. And black so dancing. I, so I didn't know this either, but I thought, oh, Elvis is just shaking his dingling no. uh, to be controversial. And he was like, no. No. That that's just what he was used to in terms of church. And yeah. He thought it was ridiculous when people went after him after that. The the decency league saying that like they wouldn't show his. I mean, it's just kind From of ridiculous. From the waist down. From the waist shown. down, it's like he's wearing freaking pants. It's not even sexual. Yeah. But and by the way, I mean, there were you know men in the 1920s and 30s like the bodybuilder Atlas men who were basically nude. So how is how is a guy fully clothed like shaking hips even? It's just bizarre. It's like a weird kind of like Puritan. What what I don't else get is it. weird is just the reaction that he would get from the girls when they would scream when you did that. Right, and one thing I've always wondered about was that there's stories that the Beatles said that that began as a publicity stunt that they paid for, and then it just started happening. Was that mm. any? Was that a publicity thing that? Colonel Tom organized or something. Not as far as I've read. Uh, he just had that, you know, it factor. He had that je ne sais quoi that all the ladies wanted a piece of Elvis. So, um... Ooh, fancy French, Jamie. <laughs> over here. He... Did you just eat a bagel? I mean, a croissant? Oui. Oui, oui. <laughs> On oui. His dad went to jail when he was really young for writing a bad check for like $14 or something mm -hmm. like that. So it was just him and his mom for a long time until his dad got out of jail. So him and his mom got super really close in their relationship. If you dig deep into this, it's You know what's really good on what? Do you know what's good on a croissant? What? Crawfish! <laughs> Crawfish! Anyway, I couldn't resist. Go ahead. Um... <laughs> yeah, so him and his mom are really close. Some, I don't know, Freud would have a good time with this relationship because it's borderline unhealthy. What do you think? Um, yeah, this was the one thing that I don't know what's going on. It didn't make any sense. But Elvis seemed to have been sort of uh, imprisoned to his mama. Yeah. And he, he just didn't grow out of this phase. He was a, a, a mama's boy. Right. So when he was like around high school age, I think, or a little bit younger, they moved to Memphis from Mississippi to get a little better life. And this is where he started getting into the music scene. Mm -hmm. um, he went down one day to record a record for his mom at Sun Records, that mm -hmm. famous music Yeah, we've been place, there. We've been there. Uh, for $4 and record his mom a song. And they started using him for things. Right. And then when they figured out he could dance, then his career kind of took off from there and also that you you go down that road where sun records is and you come to like the peabody and the clothier and that was in the movie because when he when they first moved there he was walking down second avenue or broadway or whatever and he saw the clothiers and remember when he was looking in mm -hmm. and he wanted to wear the fancy outfits but he was poor and him and that other singer uh, it's bb bb king. king yeah they went to the same clothing store and the on Bill Street there. Yeah. Yeah. And played in the same places. So pretty much from his very first performances, he was a hit. And he would go around singing in like fairs and carnivals mm -hmm. and stuff. And this right. is where current
Colonel Tom spotted him and was like, that's my cash cow. Yes. Right? Right. And uh, we'll get into Colonel Tom in a bit, but uh, yeah, he, th- this begins the nefarious connections. This is, this is the, pro- <laughs> the source of many of the problems here. So this book is just kind of like a nice overview. Um, what they really play up was his generosity all throughout his life because he had come from such a poor upbringing. Mm -hmm. He would just give anybody whatever they asked for. He would just like buy Cadillacs. Like he was the first Oprah. Like you get a car and you get a car and you get a car. We were watching some documentary and they made that point that like that Oprah got that from Elvis. Yeah. And he would buy people houses. He would buy them horses. Whatever he's buying for themselves. Okay. Okay. He um, is buying for all of the guys on his squad. Mm Mm-hmm. He did not like the wives to come along on his trips. So he would go... When he got a little more famous, he started making... He sounds like Teal Swan. Is that a Teal (laughs) Swan thing? I feel like you're not in alignment with me. I feel like you're not in alignment with me. I don't want you on the journey. Yeah. So... When he started making money and started making movies, he bought Graceland for his parents, and then he would go to California a couple times a year to make movies, and he would take all his guys with him. Mm-hmm. And the wives weren't allowed to go. So, Which, by the way, Graceland is not a gigantic mansion. It's like a nice plantation-style farmhouse. Yeah, it's not it's very fancy. big at all. And it no one is allowed upstairs because they don't want weird-looking That's out of respect, right? baby. Yeah. To where he died supposedly (laughs) no no going to that potty baby okay so let's talk about his drug use for a second which not a lot of people don't flush that potty nobody's flush it baby he had to start taking pills to stay awake right so he early on he had been taking uppers Mm -hmm. i don't even know what the drugs are but just generically in the 40s and 50s there's uppers and downers and that's all your grandparents took the only drugs they had yeah. It was just uppers and downers. He didn't drink. Just little white pills that are uppers and downers, that's it. He didn't smoke. <laughs> yeah, he, he didn't, didn't do anything. Weed. He didn't do any of the weird hippie um, drugs. Yeah. Only one time did he do acid. And one, you said one time they smoked weed and yeah. he, he thought it made him tired. It made so. him tired and hungry and so he just didn't see the point of it. But Elvis's psychology was like, he was a goody two-shoes. He thought he was um, Captain Marvel. Yeah, this is an interesting thing I didn't know either, is that he was raised on comic books as a poor kid, and so he read Captain Marvel Jr., a comic mm-hmm. book I've never heard of. but Because mm-hmm. I've heard of Captain Marvel, but not Captain Marvel Jr. But So he identified with this archetype and thought that he was like on some kind of divine providential mission yes. to help save America from the enemies of like, Captain Marvel, right? So. Yeah. Uh, he would design his outfits in the style of the suits the, of Captain well, uh, that's Marvel where Jr. The cape comes from. Yeah. What he would, like <clears throat> that eagle cape that he had, the lightning bolt, the taking care of business mm-hmm. lightning bolt. Two B, baby. Two B. Um, Priscilla <laughs> likes to take credit for that. She was like, one time we were in a plane and the lightning struck, and I said, make a thing out of lightning. But if you look at it, it looks exactly like the Captain Marvel right. lightning bolt. Um, he, the way he picked his girlfriends was. If they look like Mary Marvel in ca- in the comic book, or if they look like his mom, <laughs> which is why he liked Madame Blavatsky because he thought Blavatsky looked like his mom too. Ugh. So that's weird. Ugh. But okay, I, so they, I don't know about all that. They started giving him pills. Somebody said that he liked Blavatsky because she looked like his mom. That's what the book said. Ugh, that's crazy. Yeah, I think uh, I mean something's wrong if. If you have a choice between Anne Margaret and that, <laughs> right? I mean, he has got some weird things going on upstairs right. in his little Elvis noggin about marriage, about family. He wanted to be traditional, he wanted to be old fashioned, he wanted to be Christian like his mom brought him up to be. But then he had this other, you know, the world was tearing him away from all that and bringing him every temptation that you could possibly imagine. So he kind of had to vacillate back and forth between like being a a good person and a bad person in his mind. Well, it also right? seems like there's some blame to be had uh, on the mom for not 
helping him to grow up and leave the nest. You know, there's a well, there's a degree of separation. That's she part of died adulthood. when he was early. Okay, so here. Yeah, but she, she must have been a kind of a manipulative figure. If oh yeah, she's blaming all of her drinking and all this on him. Yeah, she's definitely has that like you know, cut the apron strings. Yeah, finally, like cut the cord. Right, you can't blame um, other people for your alcoholism. You know what I mean? That's yeah. crazy. <clears throat> so what happened to her was. So he gets super famous, and is this in the forties? This is in the fifties. Okay. And he gets in trouble for like riling up sexual passions for the in the young girls, and there's this whole hullabaloo with his concert that like causes a stampede and all this stuff. And so Colonel Tom thinks that Elvis needs to join the army. Yeah. So he gets drafted. Um, and I think Colonel Tom had something to do with that. He did. It was part of a PR type of stunt to remake his image. And that comes up in the Potash book because John Potash makes an argument that this might have actually been more than it appears to be. That there was actually a kind of a, a co-opting of Elvis, a beginning of a co-opting of Elvis into the system at this point. Mm-hmm. And this is so strange because, like, think about Justin Bieber. What, what would happen if Justin Bieber got drafted when he was at his peak? So Elvis was at his peak as a teenage heartthrob, and then he has to join the military for two years. Mm -hmm. And then he goes to Germany, and who knows what's happening over there. It could be like MKUltra stuff. He could have got the Ludovico method (laughs) happening on him. You didn't see anything in any of the books, did you, about that? Well, not a lot of people know. That's what Potash speculates, is that maybe he was... He doesn't say for sure that there's anything in Keltra. We we don't know that. That's a theory, but he does say that um, people that knew him thought that he seemed different after his time in the military. Well, here's the thing. Colonel Tom is a master hypnotist. Right, which I thought we... Yeah, we'll get to that in a little bit. Okay. Because that comes up in here. Okay. So, while he's in Germany, he's about, like, 24 years old, 25 years old, and he meets Priscilla, who's only 14 years old at the time, Mm -hmm. and his mom had just died. Because he got drafted, she kept on drinking because she was so worried about him that she just kind of drank herself to death for worry. Right. Well, Potash shows a declassified uh, FBI document that they had been surveilling Elvis for a while. Mm -hmm. So that also could speak to the possibility of trying to bring him into working in the system, which we turns out eventually does seem to be the case. Mm -hmm. Um, So mom had a drinking problem. She also had a diet pill problem, which Elvis inherited because he was always like going up and down in his weight and trying to like keep stay trim, even though he ate like crazy amounts of food of crawfish <laughs> crawfish yeah crawfish. i mean the reports of what his meals were were crazy like an, an entire loaf of bread an entire jar of peanut butter an entire jar of jelly and a pound of bacon in the middle and an entire jar of crawfish yes and a bucket of crawfish <laughs> he's obsessed with crawfish yeah, I don't know. no just the song crawfish <laughs> it's catchy um, so I've never had a crawfish. He's used to taking gross. diet pills and uppers to stay awake to right. do his duties in the army and downers to go to sleep when he used to go to sleep. He's also a teen heartthrob. Everyone already recognizes him. No matter where he goes, even in Germany, they know everybody knows who Elvis Presley is. The Elvis. <laughs> the Elvis. <laughs> the Elvis. <laughs> the Elvis. So, I actually also read Elvis and Me by Priscilla, and she tells their whole love story. Um, 14 years old, she's being picked up and brought to his um, place where he stays while he's in the military for dates. He's also got another little girlfriend over in Germany, so he's like juggling Priscilla and this other girl. He will not sleep with Priscilla because that's wrong. Um, but he is, I mean, you would call it grooming nowadays. You would call it like. I think it was a lot more common though back then for yeah it to be a prepared kind of. The, the parents had a lot more of a role in it. And that's why the military dad, right? Her dad was like an, a military officer, yes, right? She was a military brat and her dad was there in the military and that's how they met. 
Um, so he starts dating her, and then he has to leave and after his two years is up and goes back to the States to start working on movies, but he keeps in touch with Priscilla. So this poor girl, I mean, her life was just, like, consumed with him from the time she was 14 until whenever. I mean, could you imagine a 14-year-old giving the chance to, you know, date the most famous boy in the whole It was like book. my brief uh, affair with Brittany. Yeah. That time that you don't know about. I'm disclosing it now. <laughs> yes. So she's being kept uh, and her, for her purity and because she looked like Mary Marvel is yeah. why he liked her. Mm -hmm. So he even said, um, I like her because she's young and I can train her to be however And also I want. keep in mind the Colonel was involved in this too because he thought that if Elvis got married it would make his image look better as not a delinquent but a family man. Yeah, because the tabloids do what the tabloids do. And, they, like, every time he made a movie, he's in the tabloid, like, oh, Elvis is dating this starlet or whoever. Well, they were also calling him a rebellious delinquent. And uh -huh. that was part of the reason that military and marriage was part of the image that Colonel Tom came up with. Yes, because he wanted him to stay like an all American yeah. boy. And um, I think that this is the period when the military realized, okay, rather than uh, going after him, they said, why don't we make him into uh, an image of Americana? And that's the tr that's the direction that it begins to go. Which is something that he liked because he wanted to be a comic book hero. Mm -hmm. So he wanted to be, you know, Captain Marvel. Um, but he did... Let's see. He didn't think anything of his dancing. He didn't think it was overtly sexual. He, because um, he's yeah, like, my that. mama approved of it. <laughs> so it's got to be okay. Yeah. Right? And she's like this, you know, crazy Pentecostal woman. Mm -hmm. so. It does have a list of all of the different, like, old-timey pills. So he had this doctor, Dr. Nick. There's and not. Some there's people, just uppers and downers. That's all they took. Right there. So, some people think that Dr. Nick had this role in um, prescribing Elvis all of these drugs. And we'll get to that in a second when we talk about... That the movie implies that. Death. Yeah. Do not think that's true? Um, well... Dr. Nick really loved Elvis, like oh, okay. a son. Like, I don't think he would be doing anything. Colonel Tom is the, the sus guy. one the villain, in this yeah. story. Um, but I think he m cared about Elvis in his own way, but actually probably not because didn't he Well, he cared about him because he, he, he his... in the movie he calls him a product. He says, remember there's that scene when they're trying they're rushing the stage? Yeah. And he says, save the merchandise. <laughs> so so he sees Elvis as a merchandise. Yeah, yeah, is financial. But Colonel Tom got... Uh, kicked out of whatever military part he was in for being yeah, that's, a I'll bring that up in a minute. or something yeah. like that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So this guy is clearly um, not a good person. No, he's a, he's a psychopathic con man, uh, and he might have been responsible for a murder, and that's why he had to leave uh, Dutch Holland or wherever he's from. Right. So he fled his hometown because people think he might have murdered somebody. He's got some really weird name. So he just took on the a persona of a, a traveling carnival barker uh, to con his way into fame and stardom, and it worked. He conned his way into millions of dollars that he basically stole from Elvis well, and took, gambled it all away. He took half of yeah. what Elvis earned. Well, there's, it, they debate it, but yeah, sometimes he jokes about it. He says, you know, it's half Elvis, half me. Mm -hmm. But or other Elvis people's... took half what I earned or yeah, something like yeah. that. Yeah, He would say stuff like that. Um, so then Elvis gets home. He's making movies. He's at the peak of his, you know, game. But he's super unhappy. He's really lonely. He is unfulfilled. He, uh, his quest for enlightenment and spirituality mm -hmm. is being hampered. And then he meets this guy called Larry Geller. Mm -hmm. Who, Larry Geller worked at the same salon as Jay Sebring. Yes. Who was the victim of the Manson family. Right, who was the famous uh, hairstylist connected to organized crime. Um, of course, he comes up in anything that you look at in regard to the Mansons, and he also comes up in Dave McGowan's excellent book, Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon. So, yeah, we definitely know about Jay Sebring's uh, insider connections. So, Jay Sebring, um, his dad was actually one of the first New Agers in L.A. 
Yes, correct. So Elvis is coming of age in the um, environment of hippies, yoga, uh, transcendental meditation. Right. And um, visiting the Self-Realization Fellowship. So he went and visited uh, Yogananda's California Self-Realization Fellowship, which we drove past. That. Remember that? Yeah. So Elvis is really questioning, like, who am I? What is... The journey. You but know, the like, weird part is that he didn't like hippies. Right. So he was interested in all these mystical ideas, but didn't like hippies. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a second. So um, he's studying masonry. He's studying Kabbalah. He's studying Taoism. He's studying Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity. He finds out that he's part Jewish, so he's really embracing that part of himself by wearing a um, Star of David around his neck and another uh, pendant that is like a Jewish symbol for Haim or for life. So he's like secretly Jewish. He did not... By descent. Yeah. He didn't explicitly reject Christianity. He did not care for Scientology. He thought that was a scam. So there's a plus one for Mr. Presley. Of all of the crazy stuff that he is going through, (laughs) he did not care for Scientology. Tom Coon over here crying. So he read... Um, one of the first books was The Impersonal Life, Autobiography of a Yogi, The Initiation of the World and Beyond the Himalayas. That's, isn't that Yogananda? I think so. Yeah. That's why you got interested in the Self-Realization Fellowship. So here's the funny thing. Like he is becoming this voracious reader of all kinds of occult books. And this book in the back of it, it has like a list of all of his um, favorite books that he read. Mm-hmm. So like. City of God's on there. Scientific Search for the Face of Jesus, Initiation, um, City of God, everything. Yeah, he read St. Augustine, City of God. That's crazy. Everything from Alice Bailey, um, Blavatsky, Paul Brunton. He, um, Let me see. I, I haven't seen those. Cheerios, Book of Numbers, The New Age Voice, Khalil Gibran, he loved, Go- uh, Gnostic Gospels, Gospel of Thomas, Manly P. P. Hall. He read Gurdjieff. Books. Yeah. So basically everything 60s es- esoteric. There's Krishnamurti. Uh, yep. Max Heindel, Rosicrucian, Cosmo Conception. Um, he read Eliphas Levi. Is that? Yeah. Eliphas Levi. Max, uh, Max Freedom. Ledbetter. Oh, he read Ledbetter. Moria. So anything. Let me see what else. I'm interested to see what else in there. Cause I, oh, Pensky. I t- Albert I, Pike. House Pensky. Yeah. Um, I took pictures, by the way, of some of the things at graceland there's esoteric books that he had there too this was sitting on his desk hey here's yogananda mm-hmm. ae weight mm-hmm. bala so this book was sitting on elvis's desk i don't know if they can see that the jewel and the lotus mm-hmm. and this is one i picked up at occupy wall street in new york at <laughs> their library um but this is just like a it's the famous survey of the sexual culture of the east so that was one of the ones that was definitely preserved for the Graceland Museum. Um, what else? So it says here, this his dissatisfaction wasn't with Christianity or the Bible, but with man's interpretations, though he believed that differences in interpretation served a purpose. He remained a Christian his whole life, but not a Christian to the exclusion of anything else. He was open to other beliefs and teachings, and even then he realized no one has all the answers. I think that he, uh, being raised in stupid Pentecostal stuff and then seeing the emptiness of of Protestantism and evangelicalism, he started looking for something mystical that would satisfy that side of it because Mm -hmm. he was a person interested in inspiration, being inspired, and, you know, and uh, he wasn't aware of orthodoxy, so, you know, he would have been a perfect... uh, convert to orthodoxy because a lot of people go on that track of like oh i'm done with my protestantism and then they have like an atheist phase or agnostic phase and then they get into like the new age right Mm -hmm. before then they start to look at orthodoxy yeah i mean this is a path that a lot of us have taken you know being raised christian and then you go through the the journey and figure out how stupid all yeah, this go other through the stuff journey, is. Yeah, go through the journey, man. You gotta do your vision quest, the man. Soul. The journey is all, man. He was really superstitious. He would, like, one time him and Larry were driving across the desert, and he thought he saw a cloud um, that looked like Stalin <laughs> turn into Jesus, and they had to, like, pull over and have a moment because he was like, that's it, man. That's my sign. He was always seeing signs. Um, 
and superstitious things. So that's why you read all the esoteric stuff too, right? Yeah. So he also If thought, he only had read some science. Mm, yeah. He, <laughs> he needed a dose of science. He also thought that his life was like a series of blessings and punishments. So he thought of God as like a giver and a taker. So he had this weird concept of fairness and duality in God. Crawfish given, crawfish taken. <laughs> yes. Sometimes you get crawfish, sometimes you don't. <laughs> see, I get them. See, they're gone. Dad gone. So him and his squad were like a frat house road show. The, oh. ma- the mafia. His entourage. And he also um, identified with the L in Elvis because L means Lord, like Elohim. Oh, Elohim and yeah. L from, you know, Stranger Things. Yeah. Um, and he thought that his name was an anagram for lives. <coughs> That's funny. Yeah. So he thought that... He faked his death. He's resurrected. It's a resurrection plot. I'm telling you. Elvis lives. <laughs> That's what I think. Just laughing at what you said. <laughs> He identified with victims of poverty, bad luck. Um, he would get really upset when things were, when he heard of tragedies and things that are unfair. He would always try to help. Like he was super um, into giving alms and just showing up at poor people's shack and giving them a new car right. or whatever yeah, well, yeah. and surprising we, them. We talked about that. Yeah. So he's really sensitive and emotional. His daily diet was a textbook example not to, what not to eat. Uh, let's see. I'm surprised he wasn't fatter than he got because... Well, he was on all those pills. Yeah, but if every day he's eating that kind of stuff, like, you, even if you're on pills, you, you're still not going to mm-hmm. keep your keep your uh, figure. Well, he also did a lot of karate. That's true. Yes, he was a black belt. Yeah. And he took a martial arts when he was in the service, and he got the nickname Tiger Man. So that's why you see like tigers on his costumes and stuff because of his karate. Uh, He tried, according to Larry Geller, he tried to live chastely. Like he really did his best. He did have a lot of girlfriends and encounters and stuff like that, cheating and everything. But in his heart, he was like, knew that he should live chastely because of his upbringing and because of what the yogis teach about like retaining your energy (coughs) and stuff like that. So it says, um, Elvis' attitude towards women was quaint. He eschewed promiscuity. Although he went through some wild periods, he says, I realized sex wasn't the answer, that you can go too far with it. So he says, it's interesting. Elvis uh, partied too hard with almost everything else, but sex was different. And he was trying to do his best because he knew he had this effect on women. And which I think comes very from... very much something I struggle with as well, <laughs> right? Oh yeah, your effect on women. And so he, um, I think he he got that magnetism from all of the occult things that he was learning, and because you know <laughs> they talk about that you know the charismatic stuff that can happen to you when you have the seething powers of Lucifer, mm. right? Mm-hmm. So a lot of this stuff is getting channeled through him and making women crazy and drop their panties. <laughs> so wait, hold on. I got a question. So what? from your reading, because everybody debates like who you really loved. Mm-hmm. So of the various uh, people that he dated and he's with, whether mm-hmm. it was Lisa Marie or... Uh, That's his daughter. I mean, Lisa. Priscilla. Uh, and Margaret. I'm sorry. Yeah. Priscilla and Margaret and then Ginger. Like, who, who was the woman that he really liked? Okay, he never really found his... But he believes in soulmates because of all of this new, uh, age, new age teaching. Yeah. So <clears throat> he really thought he never really found his soulmate because Priscilla was so young. Um, she didn't like any of the stuff he was she into. She was not into esoteric books whatsoever. He tried to send her to Manly P. Hall lectures to get her <laughs> like interested in this stuff. But she just thought it was super boring and she didn't care about it. But then <clears throat> after... So he didn't touch, he didn't have intercourse with her until after they were married. Because he was like saving it. Because he really uh, valued 
virtue and he wanted a virgin or whatever. Um, but then she got pregnant immediately and had Lisa Marie like nine months exactly after their wedding. And then he got weird and didn't want to be with her anymore in the bedroom because she was now a mom and that was weird. Oh, because of mom things. Yes. So he's got this like Madonna whore thing going on probably. Uh, he needs to be psychoanalyzed for his... <laughs> But, well, psychoanalysis is bullshit. So. I know. I'm just joking. I know. So he couldn't read his fan mail because it was so dirty. He had to employ other people to open it and answer his fan mail because people were sending him... Just trash bins full of panties. Uh, and bras. Nude pictures yeah. and like <laughs> offers. And it says... I mean, this one story he's telling when he goes, Let, let's do something bad. Or he's like, let's do something naughty. And so he goes to open his fan mail. And there's like all these girls, homely girls. It says, uh, they were so homely, <laughs> but the poses were so lewd. It was unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> but then he also had this um, problem because he knew he was a sex symbol, but he didn't think that he could live up to the hype. Because they go to bed with Elvis and they wake up with just a person. Mm. So he didn't know if he could be Elvis in bed. <laughs> um, he did have a temper, but he, he would always like apologize. Okay. Uh, let's see. Here's Colonel Tom's story. Immigrant from Holland named Kujik. Kujik. Right. Yeah, I mentioned that. And he said he was from Huntington, West Virginia. Ha ha, yeah, right. So, there's all these discrepancies. I'll, well, I'll get to that in a second. Um, what else? Okay, so this is why... What was Parker's power over Elvis? Ultimately, his power over was strong because Elvis gave it to him. Only Parker could convince Elvis to do what he wanted him to do every time he asked. He intimidated Elvis, and he spoke of fearing him. Rumors circulated among the guys that Parker knew a lot about hypnotism and mind control. So, Colonel Tom could walk into the room with all Elvis's buddies in there and get them to do things like bark like a dog or, you know... Through hypnosis. Through hypnosis and do weird stuff. And Larry Geller is not uh, able to be hypnotized for whatever reason. And so Colonel Tom thinks that Larry is in on the grift, grifting Elvis with hypnotism. Yeah. And would, like, give him wink, wink, like, we control Elvis, right? Yeah, and um, there is something to that because here's a picture of Colonel Tom's. He was part of this weird thing connected to Nixon, the Snowmen's League of America, which is some kind of basically it's like a secret society for people involved in the Carnival <laughs> Carnival Barker Secret Society. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a real thing, right? And then uh, you'll notice here's a little book that Colonel Tom wrote. Here it is, the Snowman's League of America. You'll see the title of it. You can see Colonel Tom there. <laughs> So, now, hold on, and I shared this on Twitter, but notice here the the first chapter of the Colonel Tom book is snowing. So he he, he called his act and his power, uh, Colonel Tom, that is the handler, um, he called it snowing. I don't know why or where he got it, but snowing as related to hypnosis and the ability to hypnotize. So you'll see that the first chapter is about hypnosis and of course hypnosis was you know heavily studied in mk ultra so there is one definite uh, connection of you know shady subtlety there that <laughs> colonel tom was involved in but of course i don't know that colonel tom was involved in mk ultra i don't there's there, but there is a, a an interesting element of um what he was involved in in terms of his military period in in, in a militia mm -hmm. connected to black ops so we'll look at that in a second uh, well, he called himself the Imperial Potentate of the Snowman's League. Right. And like because he said... Because it's a secret. It's like a Masonic thing for carnival barkers. Yeah. And the snowing is conning people. Right. So um, the snow is like the, you know... What? Gets in your eyes or obstructs your... Oh, it, dist it distracts you? Yeah. Okay. I didn't understand what snow has to do with conning people. I never, is, is it making it rain? Yeah. But it's no. So this says, according to several sources, Parker's colleagues included motion picture and record company executives, high-level corporate officials, perhaps even a U.S. president or two in this weird con artist club. 
Well, I think he was friends with Nixon, or he had some connection to Nixon. The, the Snowman's League was a was the Nixon connected thing. Mm-hmm. You're not listening. Yeah. Okay. Like I'm talking, and then Jamie will say, <laughs> he'll say what I said like five minutes later. So Colonel um, thought that Jerry or Larry Geller was a magician. Um, Wait, why? Because he was not able to be snowed by him. What kind of magician? A stage magician? Joe Bluth magician? Or like a David, Just, David no, Copperfield? like an like... occultic, like one of us, like a, oh. a magician. Okay. Um, let's see. His prescriptions right here is talking about Sakonal, Tunal, and Perkadan. I don't know. Anyway. He was really searching. He's talking about all he wants to know is the truth, how to experience God. He says, I'm a searcher. That's what I'm all about. You woke that up in me, and ever since I started, I haven't had one experience. I really believe in the spiritual teachings. I believe only nothing happens, and I want it to. Oh, man, I want it so bad. What the hell is wrong? So he's wanting a, um enlightenment experience. He's wanting like a, his mind yeah. to be blown Um and he's reading all these books, seeking out. Well, I think that the, that the sort of banal emptiness of the Protestant evangelical world is what leads people to want and look for religious experience that's fulfilling outside of those realms. Mm-hmm. And so, people, if people think that's what Christianity is, they're gonna they're gonna look elsewhere. You know, when they realize that the world is bigger than this, you know, dumb local Pentecostal church. Yeah. Well, not only that, he had attained the peak of success in Hollywood and music. um, And there was nowhere to go but down. And so he wanted to go the spiritual route. And he's like, I've got to do something real with my life. I want out. I want to become a monk and join a monastery. I want to be with God now. I I don't want this BS anymore. So he's really serious about religiosity Mm -hmm. and then there's this funny story about how they went to see jackie wilson perform okay and you know that uh Mm -hmm. your love lifting me high oh okay yeah and they noticed he's sweating all over jackie wilson sweating all over the fans and the girls are loving it and thinking it's all sexy and i was like hey man how do you how do you work up with that much sweat and jackie wilson's like i just take these tablets these salt tablets and i guzzle like some water and i sweat like crazy and the girls love it okay and then okay so his costumes start reflecting this esoteric right we started noticing that because you noticed that he has the Mayan sun symbol on the back of his uh, later, right. in his uh, thus big Zarathustra phase towards the end. Dun, 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 dun. Mm-hmm. No. Um, I know. That's the 2001 song, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so this is a picture of the like ascended masters in the books that he was reading about. Theosophy and um, you can see the high collars. Yeah. So this is the kind of stuff that so they're he tried to, informing his performance now. By the time of what? The, this is the 60s or 70s? This is... Late 60s, early 70s? Late 60s after his movies. So he's making the, you know, the, the wild looking costumes are supposed to be like some kind of weird ascended master mm-hmm. outfit. That's <laughs> crazy. He meditated every day. And what is this about? This book that he was into? The Jewel and the Lotus? Yeah. What is this about? Um... Sexual culture of the East. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So I'll show you guys. Like when when I took pictures, they have his uh, desk sitting there, and it, they show you some of the pictures or some of the books on his desk. So here you can see the looking, the Jewel in the Lotus, the Looking Glass God, are the books sitting on Elvis's desk, and then look at the one in the middle, and that is New Age interpretations of the Bible. See that there? I was surprised to see that (laughs) because I didn't really know. he. I mean, I'd heard that he had this phase of esoteric stuff, but it was weird to see it at Grace when I was sitting there on the desk. It said one of his favorite books was Rudyard's New Mansions for New Men. Have you heard of that book? Mm -mm. Here is the living room. (laughs) Jamie's standing there in the living room with the... That's Graceland. 
Right. That's not our living room. <laughs> or is it? Look, the peacock. We, you like these peacocks, we, right? We um, have made a replica of Graceland as our house. Right? Here's the war room. And this is weird because when he met Nixon, he said, I like the, he's got three TVs. I want a war room like a president's got three TVs in there. This is what he called his Intel Intel yeah. room, so his Intel war room. The ABC, CBS, and NBC News all at the same time, right? I got to know what's going on, baby. So he was really into yoga, and there was this uh, secret yoga move that Larry Geller learned. Pre- I, don't, I don't know what it's called. Kriya. Have you ever heard that? No, I have no idea what okay. that is. I don't think about yoga. So it's a, it's a super secret initiation type of yoga move called Kriya Yoga. And Elvis didn't want to go through the discipline to learn it. So he just had Larry teach it to him, even though that was like forbidden. <laughs> okay, what is this supposed to do? I What's don't know. The, what, what does a magic yoga move do? Kriya Yoga is an instrument through which human evolution can be quickened, it says. Okay. Anyway. Um, Just listen to Yogananda. Here he is going to the self-realization ashram all the time in Pacific Palisades. He was a student of this person named Daya Mata, some yoga lady. He says, no to Scientology. He says, Elvis was convinced that the Scientologists had ulterior motives and were very dangerous, so he kept away from them. Ironically, after Elvis' death, Priscilla became involved in Scientology, as did his daughter, Lisa Marie. Whoa. Now, uh, there's another theory, which does that book have anything to do with like the DEA involvement? Yeah, there's a couple stories about that. Does that guy think he was or what? Um, yeah. So, yeah, we'll get to that Nixon story. Well, I was going to show this picture. Should I wait or not? Yeah, wait for a second. Okay. Okay. So, Elvis thought he could heal people. Because his mother healed him through touch and prayer. How do you know he can't? <laughs> he says, I once saw Elvis heal a man who was having a heart attack. Another time, Elvis treated Jerry Schilling after he had taken a nasty spill on his mo- motorcycle was unable to move. The next thing I knew, Jerry said, I woke up the following morning healed. So people believed in his powers. Well, I thought it was a joke, but then like you see these really like interviews that, where they make fun of the you know, redneck fans of Elvis and mm-hmm. the people who love him. And they're like, I think he can heal people. Yeah. They thought that. They really, so, thought, they, they really thought that. Yeah. And they would bring, you know, sick people and play, and like, how you know how you touch a priest's robe when he walks right. by? Right. They thought if they could touch him like that, that wow. they would get a healing. Um, and they were always like doing healings on Minnie Mae, the grandma. And Elvis would be like, I bet she outlives all of us. And she actually did, which is really funny. Hmm. It says, in the 70s, I witnessed hundreds of concert goers carrying their sick or crippled children to the stage and crying out, Elvis, please touch my baby. Whoa. Elvis, just hold so it for a really minute. So people really thought, like yeah. a lot of people actually thought that. I thought this was a joke. Mm-hmm. People really thought that he could heal people. This is nuts. Few, fan, few fans. Is this why he like thought he was kind of an evangelist? Yeah. Few fans knew of his studies then, and yet thousands apparently sensed that he had some ability to heal. <laughs> this is crazy. Um, Elvis identified with Jesus. He was fascinated by him. He saw like correlations in his life to Jesus. But he was also into like Gnostic stuff, so he was pretty confused. But he was also, seems like he was uh, constantly on these drugs, right? Which were causing weird, I mean, obviously the drugs were causing weird thoughts and actions too, right? Yeah, but he he didn't think he was doing anything wrong because the drugs were all prescribed by this a was a, yeah this was a key point. So I thought he was just a junkie, but he thought that because the doctor like he had that boomer attitude that well the doctor says it, it's not right drug abuse right mm-hmm. uh, and then and he thought that the hippies and the druggies were going to destroy the country mm-hmm. right the weathermen and all these people were going to destroy America so but but <laughs> so he had that attitude that. Well, if it has a prescription behind it, right? Right. But you said it was something. There was something that suggested that later on he kind of like wised up to that, and it was one of the documentaries you watched, I think, where it's like later on he realized that well, just because it's being prescribed doesn't mean it's good. Right. So 
he um he believed in the white the great white brotherhood and he thought that he was working under the aegis of the masters the ascended masters and he truly felt he had be chosen to be here now as a modern day savior in christ so he's got a messiah complex for sure right. how did he do we know who exactly introduced him to the new agey stuff this is guy. it geller did yeah oh he introduced him to the ideas he was supplying him with all the books because Geller's dad was a New Ager. Oh, interesting. One of the first New Agers in California. And this is just a, one of his entourage. Yes. He was a hairstylist that went that Elvis went to and they started talking and I was like, you know about this stuff? And he's but like, not Jay Sebring. No, he worked at Jay Sebring okay, Salon. Okay, I see, I see. So Larry Geller worked at Jay Sebring Salon. I see, right. Elvis got his hair done by Larry Geller. But that who, salon is a organized crime front. Oh, is it? Yeah. Jay Sebring worked with the mob. Uh-huh. Another sus character in his entourage was Joe Esposito, who could have had connections to the mob because sure. he is the one that came back with Elvis after the military and became part of the troop. Mm-hmm. Well, but I think Colonel Tom is the one that's clearly working for the mob. And Well, I think Esposito had connections too. <clears throat> um, let's see. Here's uh, me by Elvis's gi. <laughs> so, if you ever wonder what an e gi looks like, there you go. <laughs> and there's me doing the little Elvis gi. As Elvis's gi, baby. So, as a e gi. The colonel actually is trying to intimidate Larry to get rid of him because Elvis is changing. Like he doesn't. He's not into the antics anymore. He doesn't want to do stupid stuff anymore. He wants to be spiritual and... Are we in the 60s now? 60s still? Yeah, like okay. late 60s. Okay. So, <clears throat> Colonel... The Colonel sets up to um, Larry's house to get robbed so he'd be scared off of hanging around Elvis. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it talks about him, the one time that he ever saw him do LSD. They just took it and they were being goofy and then they ordered pizza and watched H.G. Wells time machine <laughs> and that's what happened when they, the one time they took acid right Let's see um okay so then one day elvis all of a sudden just decides to fire larry geller or like part ways amicably mm-hmm. he he had an accident in the bathroom like someone hit him over the head and he came down and <clears throat> after that he dismissed Larry so he didn't work with him for a while uh, while Elvis like had the baby mm-hmm. and then he came back to work with him later on um, and this is like his Vegas era Okay. Uh, and now by now he's reading Rosicrucian, Cosmic Conception, Urantia Book, Blavatsky um, Manly P. Hall Oh, and Larry Geller... Is he just flying around on the plane reading this crap? Like, is, You said he, that he would bring all these books on the plane, He right? had trunks of like 300 <laughs> books that he made his guys carry around. And his so guys... So here's the private plane, the Lisa Marie. There's me set up. Let's get up on the Lisa Marie, baby. I'm going to make these clouds rain on my mind, baby. <laughs> well, yeah, there's a story in there where he opens the window and he's like, I'm going to make it stop raining. And he goes like this and the clouds part and they're like, no way. <laughs> So they all of the guys thought that he had like mystical powers. Well, keep in mind too when you walk inside of the plane, Mm -hmm. everything's covered in uh, plastic because you can walk inside the Lisa Marie, right? And it literally looks—it's decked out like it's seventies Vegas, and it smells like sweaty Elvis. I'm not joking. It It does smell sweaty in there. Yeah. So there's. If you want to know what the plane. Elvis in Vegas smells like, then you go in that plane. Um, Larry believed that the colonel had uh, hypnotic powers over Elvis. Larry also had this magazine called The New Age Voice, Hmm. which Elvis formed a male backup vocal trio and named them The Voice after this New Age publication. So here's Jamie out front of Graceland. You can see it's actually not that huge. It's just kind of... I mean, it's a nice house, but it's not like a giant mansion. Here's 
Here he's talking about mob CEOs. Um, Elvis says, this is a dangerous universe. No matter who you are, the higher you are, the more dangerous it is. In the 20s and the 30s, the gangs would mow you down in the streets or they'd dump your body in the river. Now those people are legitimate businesses. They're businessmen. They run corporations. They own the great things of America, so they go about things in a different way now. They're very nice, and they negotiate, and they'll talk to you. So he's warning, giving Larry these um, hints that mobs are... Yeah. ruling things right and this is and the then, 70s right yeah and then yeah. he has this idea that especially vegas actually I mean. sam cook was murdered because uh, of this. i think i think potash talks about that oh really i think so yeah yeah he says why do you think sam cook is dead he asked me everyone thinks he was murdered in a motel oh he was murdered all right he was murdered because he got out of line i got it from the horse's mouth cook was told that he had a big mouth to stay in line and he didn't do it so now Elvis is like getting nervous. Mm -hmm. about well, this the is the period when there's threats on Elvis's life. There's people that are trying to kill him. They tried to bomb his plane at one point in Germany. Remember mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. There was a bomb attempt on the uh, airplane when he was in the military in Germany. Now he's getting these death threats when he's in uh, Vegas. Mm -hmm. And so then he starts, he gets really into guns and he starts carrying a gun in his boot, right? Mm hmm. And that, didn't Alice Cooper have a funny story about him? Right, because Elvis was a black belt. And then the story is that when he met him, that uh, he, he waited for like four hours to meet Elvis outside his entourage, outside the room. And then when he finally got in there, the first thing Elvis did was he said, could you take a gun away from a man pointing at you? And he taught him how to remove a gun, and that was it. Yeah. So here, hold this gun. I'm going to show you how to do it, baby. He was a character, man. And then Liza Minnelli tells a story about the first time she met him. She was sitting in there in his room, and, and he pops out of a closet doing karate moves in front of everyone. <laughs> now, so. that probably is what led him to the possible uh, FBI or DEA work. Mm. And it's speculation. We don't exactly know how much he was involved in this. But mm -hmm. you'll notice that, so if you watch the Bayes Lit Analyzer's uh, stream. He talks about Elvis being a big fan of law enforcement and collecting badges. And if you go to Graceland, you'll walk through there and you'll see this is the, this is all his badges. And then you'll see the picture of him with all the cops and drug enforcement people there. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very plausible that he really was because he really wanted to be deputized, right, as some kind of law enforcement person. Well, yeah. And so one day he wakes up and he decides to fly to Washington, D.C. to meet with the president. With Nixon. He writes a letter to Nixon. So he writes this letter on the plane, and he's like... Uh, I want to help out. I want to save the country. Uh, the hippies and the druggies are going to take over and destroy the country. I feel like I could do my part. Yeah. <laughs> so he scrawls out this le this note on a, like American Airlines stationery, <laughs> and he drives up to the White House. He's like, I want to meet with the president. And they're like, "Uh, you don't have an appointment. Said, so, I'm Elvis, baby. <laughs> yeah, so he goes to wait for to see if they'll... Um, approve him meeting with the president and they're like okay yeah you can because you're such a influential person um and he's like talking about how the beatles and their disestablishmentarianism is bringing down the youth of the country and he wants to help fight that and the black panthers and the hippies and all of these other groups trust him and so he can infiltrate from within yeah so there's a theory that he it was involved in working with the dea and there's quite a few images and pictures of Elvis wearing his tracksuit, which is a DEA tracksuit. Well, this book talks about he did have an undercover DEA in his um, entourage. Right. So he was doing that. So he gets his badge mm -hmm. from Nixon. Um, what else? Oh, okay. So by 1974, he's getting pretty lonely. And he's trying to get Larry to fix him up with girls because he doesn't know how to meet girls. Well, he... when does she leave him? Do you remember? Before the Vegas stuff. Okay. So. Because. Priscilla's gone. He. He didn't, was not interested in her going to bed with her anymore after she had the baby. Mm -hmm. So she had an affair with a karate instructor. His karate instructor. Yeah. And then she started learning more karate and. Well, Elvis put out a hit on the guy, and then the FBI stopped it. That also might have contributed to his being recruited. According to this book, she had two karate boyfriends. So one karate boyfriend, and then the main one, Mike, I think his name was, 
And she was also learning karate from mm-hmm. Chuck Norris. <laughs> <laughs> Did it mention anything about the hit? Mm, I don't remember. So he's like, Larry, fix me up with the girls. He doesn't like um, cornography. Oh. And whenever. It's like pornography. He, yeah. Don't give me no when, corn, baby. Whenever. I want it on the cob. Whenever he would walk in, the guys would be watching it. He would just like walk out because he didn't care for it. And he thought that was not his like. It mm-hmm. doesn't. It wasn't all Captain Marvel, you know. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Um, also, the drugs curtailed his libido, so he avoided situations that might get out of hand and started viewing women in a more romantic way. He mm. was always looking for his soulmate, Mary Marvel, mm-hmm. but he had all of these weird psychosis about women, so yeah. Now, the jungle room, down in the jungle room, when I was walking in Memphis, is not, is not what you think it is, right? You, you hear these songs and you think... It's just like a tiki lounge. <laughs> That's all it is. Like a room upstairs. It's not. It's on the first floor. It's not actually in the. It's bed. like off the kitchen. Yeah, and it's like just this den. Den. That's a tiki room. Well, he loved Hawaii. So right. So he wanted to bring the tiki culture. Every time right. he went to Hawaii, he was just like a door. They considered him an uh, honorary Hawaiian. Right. Um. <clears throat> that was one of his favorite places. Let's see. They stole his money. Colonel Parker. Let's see. Elvis would have been a billionaire. Right. Well, I think the estate is a billionaire now, but yeah. Yeah. Except Colonel Parker took a lot of it. So this is where it starts to get weird because Larry Geller is painting this picture of Elvis losing vitality and losing health and being so beat up and battered and tired by 1977 when he supposedly died. Um <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, Jamie met him in a, in a supermarket in Kalamazoo. Elvis came to me in a dream and he said, I'm still alive, baby. Still alive, baby. Yeah. Tell the people. So Larry Geller's talking. The king is alive. He's like, he had glaucoma. He had a twisted colon. He said, this guy says he had leukemia, which I never heard of from anyone else. Um, he was all bruised, blotches, discolorations, weight gain. Uh, that ain't him. That ain't, the, that ain't the real Elvis. The one that's all fat ain't him. So he's painting this picture that Elvis's health is like super declining by the end of this book. Right. Um. Oh yeah, here it says they bitch and complain because they have to carry the trunks with his portable library. Right. Can I bring in this part now? Yeah. Okay. Are you done with that book? Uh, I'll I'll look for one more two things. So the uh, really interesting elements that. Uh, Potash brings in in his excellent book again from my publisher if you want to copy of this it's uh, Trine Day's book Drugs is a Weapon Against Us uh, really good book for covering not just Elvis but it kind of goes through all of the old Elvis era uh, Hollywood people and pop stars up to the modern day and even gets into like Jimi Hendrix and Tupac and this kind of stuff and you know the, the deep state continually has an interest in uh, these people for various reasons but Potash notes that uh, as mentioned the FBI admitted uh, that it had a file on Elvis starting in the 1950s uh, Colonel Tom Parker talked Elvis into a management deal in 1955 when Elvis was 20 and it was already a famous star in 1948 Colonel Tom received the rank of Colonel from the Louisiana State Militia which was involved in major U.S. intelligence operations and covert warfare uh, and his footnote for that is a guy named Adam Victor, the Elvis Encyclopedia. And it says, uh, one other major U.S. intelligence uh, covert operation was run through this state mili- Louisiana State Militia, as well as the Louisiana Army National Guard, documented to have played a major role uh, also in the skullduggery around the MLK uh, assassination. MLK's friends and attorney, friend and attorney William Pepper, claimed in his book *Order to Kill* that the 20th Special Forces Group played a, a significant role in the assassination uh, re- involving MLK. And Pepper wrote that the 20th Special Forces Group in behind the fence covered operations is the very group that Colonel Tom belonged to. So again, we don't know how how 
connected to this Colonel Tom was, but that's where the title Colonel Tom uh, comes from, according to this author. Some people say he's just a con man; it's all made up, so it's hard to know. But um, it does make sense if he's uh, trained and adept at hypnosis that he would have had a time in, you know, military or in uh, special forces to some to some extent. Elvis's former manager, um, Memphis radio DJ Bob Neal, reportedly couldn't accommodate Elvis's success, and so he handed him over to uh, Colonel Parker. Parker took immediate control of Elvis's management and life uh, Parker did this perhaps on the behalf of uh, did Parker do this on the behalf of US intelligence in the late 1950s the army drafted Elvis mainly uh, uh, and mainly stationed him in Germany from 1958 to 1960 as previously noted M. Kelcher was being conducted via former naval uh, Nazi intelligence and their military bases in Germany paperclip he's saying the close associate of Elvis and Parker introduced Elvis to amphetamines early on and Elvis started using them heavily while in the army. Researchers also claim that Elvis, the Elvis that emerged from the 19, uh, from the army in, the, in 1960 bore a little similarity to the Elvis prior to 1958. Beatle John Lennon, uh, who watched Elvis's career closely, later stated on BBC Radio 1 that when Elvis died, people were harassing me for a comment. I'll give it to you now. Elvis died when he went into the military. <laughs> So, according to John Lennon, Elvis died in 1958. The writers described the vast control that Colonel Parker had over Elvis as one of the as one that took place over the rest of his life. Parker would not let Elvis leave Vegas for any kind of uh, performance outside of the U.S. And if you watch the movie, that comes up in the movie. Here, by the way, is the uh, uh, and by the way, this he makes a point about es- Esposito too. I think. Um, according to what you were saying. Mm -hmm. Parker and Esposito, along with many other of the Memphis Mafia, worked with Elvis, uh, encouraged and increasingly aided in this drug problem. So they didn't help him, is what he's trying to say. Elvis's addiction led to multiple near-death experiences and overdoses, uh, and he could barely function at times. If Colonel Parker and his associates worked for U.S. intelligence as their control of Elvis might suggest, then the wealthiest had power over a music star with influence over millions of fans from the very get-go. In other words, that this is where they first figured out the power of a pop star and the control that you could, what you could do with social engineering through a pop star. And my theory is that they realized that he would be the ultimate image of Americana. So Elvis becomes an Americana propaganda tool um, if this theory is correct. And there you can see that there's the FBI file on, on Declassified where they had started in the 50s on Elvis. Anyway, that's all. Mm. So now we're getting winding down to. Now we get to the crazy part. Supposed end of life, and his last girlfriend was named Ginger, and he was kind of waiting until marriage to be with her. And he was telling Larry, "I want this relationship to be right. I know others might laugh, but to hell with them. Sex energy is the strongest energy in the body. If you don't." Control it, master it, it will master and control you. Sex is one of the greatest gifts of God, but it will remain a gift only if we don't abuse it. So he's really serious about this. He says, I'm no prude, that's for sure. But being ruled solely by our animal nature will never bring us true enjoyment. Crawfish. All right, now um, let's get to Now, <clears throat> oh. so when Jamie first told me this part, the other book that she's looking at now about the possibility that Elvis didn't die, I was like, the first thing I heard, when I heard that, I was like, what? That's that's like Bigfoot level stupid conspiracy stuff. But then the more I thought about it and the more I thought about, well, if he was in working for the DEA, if he really did have that um, that job for a time, which is, which is plausible, then... There are, they will uh, fake people's deaths and and people can go into witness protection. So the only way that I see that as somewhat possible is that because there was the mafia connection with Colonel Tom, Colonel Tom had apparently racked up these uh, gambling debts to the mob in Vegas. And so, you know, Elvis wanted to do a world tour. He wanted to leave and get out of all this and he was sick of it. And so it's very plausible that if he saw himself as an American hero, this could be the way out of all of this to uh you know relocate and fake his death and just live a new a new life that's possible um anyway and there's a few anomalies with the casket and all this stuff which is fun to speculate about but tell us about this well 
let's establish a motive like you almost did right now. He did not want to be Elvis Presley anymore. He mm-hmm. was sick of it. He would never had a normal life. He couldn't go anywhere without being swamped and mobbed by fans. He'd never been out of the country except for Germany. He wanted to see the world. Mm -hmm. He was out of shape. He wanted to be off drugs. Like, he just wanted out, basically. Mm -hmm. But the only way he probably thought he could do this was by faking his death. Um, So, I read this interesting little ditty. Is Elvis still alive? Does she argue that it's a witness protection? Um, Or that he just ran away? She, yeah. Okay, so... Why, after he supposedly died... Okay, let me think. The day of the death was like August... Middle of August, 1977. And there's so many discrepancies. Every person you ask will give you a different story. Um, So nobody can get their story straight. They can't even decide what book he was supposedly reading when he died. Some (laughs) say it was Sex and Psychic Energies. Some say it was something about the face of Jesus. I can't remember the exact name of it. But it's always like a different book that he had on him when he supposedly went to the toilet and Mm -hmm. never came back. So Maybe there's a CERN portal upstairs at that (laughs) toilet and he's in another dimension. Yeah. So they find him up there in the afternoon. Um... And then, but before that, he'd stay up till four in the morning playing racquetball. Right. So. Yeah, we saw that racquetball court, by the way. A guy who's about to die of drugs is staying up all night playing a racquetball, eating just fine, mm-hmm. uh, reading, not feeling ill whatsoever. Right. Um, his girlfriend is there, <clears throat> Ginger. And. <clears throat> Everybody who viewed him in the casket said he it looked like a wax head. Right. People do say this. Uh, now, when we went to Graceland, I didn't dig it up. So I there's know, stories so. of Larry Geller having to glue on <laughs> his sideburn to the wax head. Um, there's stories. There's speculations. Like, was there actually a sick man? How much could we get on eBay for a single Elvis sideburn? If we, if oh, we man, that's it? priceless. <laughs> it has healing powers. And it's, like, <laughs> it's a relic. It's incorruptible. Well, the relic. people were treat the, they treat this stuff like relics. Like, when you go there, it's like this mecca. It's like a boomer mecca. And there's relics of, it's like Elvis's first dollar he made. You know, all that kind of stuff hanging up on the wall. Yeah. A couple years later... This singer comes out named Jimmy Orion Ellis, right? And he looks well, and sounds watched, like yeah. Elvis. Well, I've watched the videos. I don't think he's Elvis. But, no, but, but right. there's two masked singers. Okay. So this lady's saying Orion was a cover for Elvis, but Elvis also did performances as Orion because people who would go to see Orion said that The one Orion would go backstage and another masked singer would come out and he he didn't have any sweat and he looked exactly like Elvis. Like old ladies are like, I know what Elvis butt looks like. (laughs) But I thought thought that Elvis wanted out of the life. So why would he be singing as a masked singer? Well, this was a couple years later. Okay. Maybe he was like missing (laughs) performing, but he realized he couldn't get away with it. So Orion just like fell off. Um, So there's two... is it not but, possible that just, I mean, I'm not against this theory, but I'm just bringing, I mean, I don't have any, I don't care either way, but um, couldn't, couldn't it just be that in a lot of these cases, there's so many Elvis impersonators that people see an Elvis impersonator and, and they think, that's him. Maybe. Because they're just really good Elvis impersonators. Yeah. Um. Well, okay, so he did work with law enforcement. Right. He would go on drug busts in disguise. Yes. He would... This is a really strong piece of evidence, yeah. A police light on his car and pull over people on Elvis Presley Boulevard and be like, just right. kidding, I'm Elvis Presley. Right. So he he loved clandestine stuff. He loved um, disguises. He loved double identity. Well, he loved that comic book thing. He exactly. thought he was playing the comic book character who was in, you know, comic book character, because they have the dual ego or the, the dual uh, uh, relationship, right? Yes. Identity. Yeah. So he thought he had that dual identity. This lady says that he was reading a book about the Shroud of Turin when he died. Well, that was in the list. That that was in the list of the books. Yeah. 
But that's three different books. Um, okay, what else? So what are some of the others? I mean, this DEA his, uh, mob thing, drug thing, that is very plausible. That's he, the strongest piece of He loved the book, I mean, the movie 2001 Space Odyssey. Right, so he would come out to this big Zarathustra at the end, the, the Honolulu phase. Yeah, the, uh, the Vegas phase. Mm-hmm. And in 2001, the spaceship is called Orion. I mean, I know, that's weak, but that okay. Is, <laughs> but that's okay. Somebody did post that, though. Like, uh, I think somebody put up a video about the Elvis Orion Sun King conspiracy. It's probably referencing those. Oh, really? Yeah. So, I wanted to read that again. Remember that King Kill 33? Yeah. That was interesting. That might be relevant to this. Yeah. So, all of the details are inconsistent. Even Geraldo did a 2020 special really? on this. Yeah. Is oh, Elvis wow. still alive? Um, and he called it the worst medical investigation of the century. Hmm. Because there's three different, like, autopsies. Hmm. There is... This weird um, thing where they brought his mom's body to Graceland. Right. And yeah. they supposedly brought his body to Graceland, but um, there was never any receipts for that. Mm -hmm. And then they misspelled his middle name right. on the gravestone. Which is odd. I mean, I mean, I don't know why that would have a whole lot to do with the burial. I mean, the faking of the death, but it is odd well, that his name is misspelled. It's Yeah, because they're super suspicious. I mean... They're superstitious people. Right. And so he wouldn't be tempting fate by putting his real name on the Yeah, gravestone. maybe. Um, he often visited the Memphis funeral home late at night, taking friends with him and looking at dead bodies. Why would he do that? Because he's Elvis. So he even Priscilla said we would go on dates to the morgue because he would like to look at the bodies and like hold their hand and like it was weird. So he had this weird... You can't thing. hold hands in the morgue? What do you mean? They're sealed. <laughs> what are you talking about? Hold their hands. Well, like on the table and stuff. What? Yeah. Hold, whose hands on the table? Like he was... Oh, fascinated. in the morgue? Yeah. <laughs> so he... <laughs> you're all... You're, he, all, you're, all, you're like super into this. this. You're he doing Elvis this. apologetics. You're the internet's new Elvis apologist. Yes. That's great. Um, you're so fiery about He this. thought that... <laughs> He could be a doctor, and he always carried around the Merck um, medical manual, and he knew all of the drugs, he knew all of the side effects, he knew all of the prescriptions, all what of the doses. What a weirdo. Doses. Yeah. Just, he's just a weird dude, man. I told you he's character of the century. Mm -hmm. And so, Geraldo thinks that he didn't do it. Fans said he looks Wait, like Wait, didn't do what? Didn't kill himself? I mean, didn't... Didn't die. I didn't know, I didn't know Geraldo believed that. Yeah. So, he came away... For his show came to the conclusion that Elvis is alive. Yeah. Wow. And this lady has a weird angle because she wrote this book called Orion, which is about a rock star that faked his death, and they squashed her book um, for no reason. So that's why she's writing this kind of, putting all this together. Um, his twin thing. So he was all about alter identities because of his... Dead twin. Because Jesse, right? So he had no, like, problem with assuming a different identity. Yeah. And he would go by the name John Burroughs sometimes. Right. And some people think that was his. Some like, people think that was DEA name. yeah his uh, undercover name for working with uh, DEA or the FBI or whatever. But guys, I want to remind you too. Um, if you want to come to my live event, it's it is a in person speaking event. It will not be live streamed. It'll be July thirtieth in Nashville. Jamie will also be speaking after I speak, so it'll be a lot of fun. We'll have a, a long time period where you can ask questions, you can bring arguments, you can bring whatever topics you want to discuss. Uh, it is a ticketed event. There will be uh, private security there, so creepers, uh, weirdos will not be allowed or tolerated. There will be. It is a. Uh, surveilled place so there's cameras outside and inside so you're not going to get away with anything if you want to come be crazy there's the tickets for the event over there on uh, eventbrite that i just put into the show description uh it's an evening with jay dyer and jamie as well 
And so hopefully you can make that out July 30th in uh, outside of Nashville, uh, a little bit north of Nashville so that we won't have to deal with all the traffic. Uh, and it'll be from 4 to 10 p.m. And uh, it'll also be a book signing as well. So you, you can purchase books there, my new book, uh, or the old books as well. Uh, you can get them signed or you can bring your copies that you have and get them signed. And it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have a kind of a multimedia type of event. Uh, there will be a, a mystery debate, <laughs> a mystery debater person that will be there. Um, we'll have a lengthy, serious discussion because I know everybody doesn't want just goofy stuff. We also got to have the serious stuff in there. So we have a serious discussion on the new book. If you guys didn't see the stream last night, I spent uh, about two hours explaining and kind of roughly going over what my book covers, the essays relating to philosophy, geopolitics, metaphysics, um, logi, logic, you know, all these different things that you always hear me covering. So again, that will be July 30th. Uh, you can get your tickets right now at Eventbrite. It is limited, so be sure and get the tickets if you want to come. Don't wait too long. Uh, it could sell out. I don't know. We don't know what's going to happen, but um, we sold quite a few tickets already, so I'm happy for that. Um, and I think it'll be a, it'll be a fun event. So if you want to uh, come out and have an opportunity to sit down and ask long, lengthy questions, then do that through the event. I just said July 30th, July 30th. OK, so that's 21 ish days from now, three weeks from now outside Nashville. Uh, it's a really cool venue. It's a hip place that's been renovated. People asked when I looked up the address, it's an antique store. I'm not playing an antique store, dude. It's a it's an event venue that is renovated. It's a whole new event space. So uh, come out because Jamie will be there too. We'll be uh, selling books and we'll be doing long, lengthy talks. You can have one on one discussions, uh, and I mean one on one in the sense of you can have you know a long back and forth. I'm not going to just talk to you the whole time. It will be uh, you know you basically got 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. right. So you got six hours, and we'll get uh, you know some long. Q and A's and some AMAs and whatever, uh, as well as lengthy presentations on the philosophical topics in the new book, which is available too, by the way, you can buy that now pre-sales at the website. You can get signed copies there. Um, where are we at now? So this lady would get calls from the Orion guy that sounded like Elvis, but she couldn't prove which one it was, but he would talk about things like twins, like explain to her, mm -hmm. uh, Things that Elvis would talk about. Well, is it possible that, that this Jimmy Orion saw himself as a twin of Elvis? Like he was just a super Elvis? Because he's a super Elvis impersonator guy. Yeah, I don't know. But it could have been a scheme Colonel Parker dreamed up for money. And he was a carnival, like, snowman. Con man, yeah. And so this could have been one of Colonel's... Well, if you go into witness protection Plans. and they, and then that would have been organized by the government, right? Because, yeah, because as soon as Colonel hears that Elvis had died, he flew straight to like New York City or something to broker a deal of merchandise before he went to Memphis of course. to the funeral. <laughs> sure. And they said he didn't even act like Elvis was dead at all, that he acted like he didn't go up to the body or act mm. sad or he, it was just like business as usual. Mm hmm. So a lot of people who were super close to him weren't acting like he was dead, especially his dad. When his mom died, they didn't want that to turn into a circus. Mm -hmm. But when he died, it was purposely made into a circus, and his dad wasn't upset about that hmm. at all. Um, I do admit that there's more to this theory than I would have ever thought. But So in Hollywood, she gives all of these examples of people saying that everybody in Hollywood knows that it was fake. Uh, I think... Nicholas Cage has this view. Really? I mean, that one of the documentaries said that Nick Cage thinks this and that he wanted at one point to make a movie about it. Oh. And that for some reason, because he was briefly married to Lisa Marie, there was some kerfluffle and he couldn't make it or something. I don't, I don't so, remember the story, but they didn't, they weren't married for very long. John Burroughs was the name that he used um, to give people like Nixon and stuff to get a hold of him. Mm hmm. And. There was reports of a person who looked like Elvis flying out of Memphis that day to Buenos Aires using the name John Burroughs. So people think that maybe he went there and then maybe went to Hawaii to like get back in shape and lose weight because he was pretty chunky mm -hmm. um, at the end. And the supposedly it looks like a wax body and it's 
sweating or something. Yeah, like there was an air conditioner in there in his coffin to keep it from melting because it was so hot. It was like August day. And supposedly, I think it was like the same week that his mother had died. Mm. So he might have chosen that. Um, this book says one of the first things Elvis asked of his spiritual leader um, at the meditation garden was the power to materialize and dematerialize at will. So he was really getting into weird thinking. Um, he's interested in the yoga of spells, which teach the continual repetition of magical phrases as a means of dissociation of the consciousness. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe he was involved in MK Ultra. <laughs> and he's talking about, I'm sick and tired of being Elvis Presley. Oh, he had no problem faking sick. So um, Priscilla tells the story one time that he like collapsed in Germany. And she went to visit him in the hospital. And the nurse came in and put his thermometer in and left the room. And Elvis takes the thermometer out and like lights it with a lighter to make it go the temperature go up. And make it seem like he had a fever or whatever to like get out of things so he was doing like he would faint he would fake faint well this is all right this sounds like uh, early versions of pr stunts i wonder if colonel tom because of his carnival background didn't kind of invent a lot of these ideas of creating pr stunts which later pop stars would follow suit yeah so he would fake faint to, to test his guys to see what they would do if they would like, you know, take care of him or put him in the bed or... or it sounds like know. he liked to play tricks and it was a prankster. He was. Okay, well then yeah. I could see him faking his death. You yeah. Know? It says he tested us a lot of times like that. Um, living as two people was no big thing to him because he was born a twin. Um, he had the cosmic alter egos, which we talked about. He was fascinated with the police. Um, <clears throat> friends with law enforcement. Let's see. Thought he was Captain Marvel. Crusader against evil. Special agents are sometimes given a new identity, <coughs> which would include a new driver's license, passport, and everything. In the case of Elvis, his code name was to be John Burroughs. I wonder if that John Gilbert documentary is probably based on her book. And, you know, in that documentary that, I mean, it's not John Gilbert, I forget what his name is, something Gilbert, but in that documentary he has, he shows all the, what are supposed to, I don't know if they're real, right? But he shows these documents which appear to be FBI declassified documents, but again, I, you know, I, don't, I don't know if they're real or not, but. Um, Pano says, as a, a Super Jet $5, greetings from Greece. Um, he, he got to visit St. Nectarios's library and relics. That's pretty awesome. He sent me a picture of that. My grandfather, um, Pano, was the same ship en route to France that Elvis was on in the 1950s. <laughs> so his grandfather rode on a ship with Elvis. Oh, That's wow. Funny. That's cool. BMX 1966. Cheers, Jay. Awesome. Thank you so much, BMX. Much appreciated. Real Cooter Brown, 750. I asked this the other night on the stream, but it was cutting in and out, and I missed if you answered it. But uh, if you and Jamie have any thoughts on the explosion of, pop explosion of popularity of astrology over the last few years, I didn't even know that it was getting popular. Uh, Top-notch stream tonight, guys, by the way. Thank you so much. Um, I didn't know that astrology was getting popular. I always just thought it was the same level of goofy popularity. This book has Elvis's natal charts in it. <laughs> okay, so... Um, <laughs> Green Feathers, $5. God bless you and Jamie. I hope you're having a great summer. Yeah, we are. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Kossi, $20. Off topic, but uh, you have me. Thank you for leading me to Orthodoxy. I attend St. Elizabeth tennis in Tennessee. Also, thank you for the work on uh, SRA. RA. Uh, you're helping people who are survivors. Well, that's great. Bring a, bringing logic, reason, and facts. It is needed. Yes. Thank you so much, Kossi. Cold Jello, fourteen dollars says nothing. Appreciate that. Cold Jello, BMX, nineteen sixty six, ten bucks again. Jay uh, has an awesome song called. Elvis has an awesome song called "If I Can Dream." If you get a chance, listen to that. Do you know that one? That's the, the name of this book. Elvis has like a million songs. So. Yes, that was the song that he sang at that TV special at the end. Oh, that one. Yeah, that's a good yeah, one. Yeah, I love that song. Genghis Khan, ten dollars. You're a legend. Thank you so. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. How's that? 
Thank you so much. DC Customs, long time through. Oh, battery went dead there. Haven't seen him in a long time. Super chatting. Great stream, Jay uh, and Jamie. Keep up the great work. Thank you so much, DC Customs. He says again for $10. So much imagery in the TV show and movies these days. Do you have your radar? What do you have on your radar for analysis? Um, well, we just saw that Elvis movie, which does talk about the colonel having that deal with the mafia, which I didn't expect. And, and it really makes him out to be a kind of a nefarious handler character. Um, what other movies are we, we're going to be doing? Probably some more esoteric horror movies, maybe that are going to, that are looking interesting. We'll have to see. Uh, I mean, I just did stranger things. So put a lot of time into kind of reviewing that. What's another movie that we've been looking at? Um, maybe a dystopia encore. Oh, we got to do the final dystopia too. So we got the part two of our dystopia series, which we find we finished that. We just haven't gotten around to it yet. Um, other movies and TV. Uh, yeah, I haven't seen or thought of any new movies to do lately, but other than Stranger Things and the dystopia films that we've done. Um, but great, uh, great question there, DC Customs. Greek Groiper, $3. Can you do a video on Bohemian Grove? I did an interview with Burmus um, about eight months ago, and we covered uh, Bohemian Grove fairly in depth, and he went really deep into that. So I think if you look over on the Rockfin with me and Burmus, uh, just type in Jade Iyer, comma Jason Burmas. You'll get a Bohemian Grove interview. Um, I cannot trust the rumors around the subject. Yeah, I mean we don't go into any rumors. We just look into you know what's verifiable. A stream debunking the stupid conspiracy theories. Um, well, the stupid conspiracy theory would be that you know that they're sacrificing humans. I don't think they're doing that there. But I mean Bo Bohemian Grove is a real place. It's a real meeting place i mean it's it's mentioned in uh one of the global elite books by helmut schmidt men in powers he talks about bohemian grove so it's not a fake thing greek groper again for three dollars in a previous video you mentioned there's a difference between the meaning and perception of nation before and after the french revolution right so before that it wasn't a rationalist enlightenment idea of nationalism it was just a uh, ethnically homogenous group of pe people in ethnos. So that's the difference rather than the idea of um, a propositional nation. What's up? I was just thinking <clears throat> he before he supposedly died he was supposed to be going on a tour, mm -hmm. a new tour mm -hmm. which he had not ordered any costumes for. He had not ordered any um, transportation or anything like that, set anything up. Mm -hmm. He had liquidated his employees. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of weird things going on. If he was supposed to be leaving on tour that day, mm -hmm. he was not prepared at all. Mm -hmm. So there just keeps coming up questions on questions on questions right. that I really think that this was some kind of like you said, going into witness protection. Right. And here it says, according to press reports following the meeting between Elvis and President Nixon, he had to be a consultant. Now he had a file number 822255 as, and provided an undercover agent of the government with a job cover. And so this is all FBI file numbers and everything right. that he is now John Burroughs, according to the government. <laughs> Interesting. I wonder if yeah. it's legit. That's where that documentary is getting it from then. There's a, also a company in Japan called Orion Press, which is licensed by Presley Enterprises to produce memorabilia. Hmm. And Orion is like a... Constellation. Well, yeah, but, it, you know, it's an esoteric mm -hmm. astrology thing. So. There's a belt you can wear, baby. I wear a Orion's belt before the concerts, baby. All of the things that I learned about this dude, I really think that he had it in him to pull off this hoax. And he probably traveled the world and lived his best life in Hawaii. <laughs> and he could still be alive at 87. I don't know. 87 year old Elvis yeah. is out there. White people space boat, $3. Jay, you have, have you looked into Roberto Solis in the case? No, I don't know about that. Screams of an intelligence connection to me, but I'm wondering if your thoughts, what your thoughts are, if you've done the research. If not, it might be worth looking into. 
nothing sus is known about him. It seems nothing sus is known. I don't know who that is, but I'll look at it. Uh, Re- Roberto Solis. Um, DC Customs, again, I would love to hear analysis of occultism and Gnosticism in contemporary entertainment. Well, we've done that a lot, bro. I mean, we've got a lot of analyses. I mean, multiple chapters in the second book are about you know Gnosticism and Hollywood and pop culture. Oh. Um, I mean, we just covered it tonight with Elvis's interest in Gnosticism and I just remember theosophy. Lots of people thought that he knew he was going to die because he would say cryptic things like, I know I look fat now, but I'm going to look good in my coffin. <laughs> really? Yeah. Or um, <laughs> singing my way and like saying weird things at his concerts Okay. Um, that people you wouldn't understand at the time right but if he had died it makes sense yeah Yeah. guys i want to remind you too that uh you know if you want that big e energy then what you want to do is head over to chalk.com choq.com that's the show sponsor and get a hold of that daily you see that daily right there that is the best supplement supplementation that you can get for your diet Our, our diets are nutrient deficient so if you want to support the show if you want to um keep me going then the best way to do that is to head on over to chalk.com and get a bottle of that daily to test it out. Um, if you aren't interested in just, if you want to be more specific, I would say head over to there to get action 2.0, just to straight up boost energy, right? I mean, this is, this is the best energy booster. I have to be careful taking that one. Um, my favorite of course is the Tonkat Ali. This jar is almost empty. Um, that's a Tonkat 100, which is proven in peer reviewed studies to boost testosterone. So, if you want to get rid of that uh, toxic soy that you have and become toxically masculine, if you want that big E energy, <laughs> then head on over there and get the Tonkat 100. Um, there's also the Sheila Jet, which that's how Jamie read all these stacks of Elvis books. She was taking Sheila Jet and it gave her mental clarity and focus beyond belief. Yes. Right, you were able to touch the hem of Elvis's garment and, Elvis, and focus on his all these Elvis books. He's alive and he's watching Jay's analysis. <laughs> okay, and if you're on the internet and you're not watching this, what are you even doing? Crawfish. Anyway, uh, DC Customs. No, we already did that. Uh, so, guys, also, I mean, if you want uh, superfoods, Chalk also offers Chalk Lit, which is a powder that you can add to your morning smoothie regimen. And you drink this every day. What do you think about it? I love it. It's my evening sweet snack instead of like ice cream or cookies yeah. or whatever. There's not a bunch of I'll sugar have in a it. Scoop of that, and it tastes like chocolate milk. It does taste like chocolate milk. Yeah, she loves it. Um, so you can get that as well. And also, there's stacks, so they put it together for you in uh, bunches, uh, bundles for men, bundles for women. Um, and you can also get uh, a recurring subscription for the Chalk.com products by using the promo code J53Life. That's J53LIFE. Again, definitely head over there. We don't know how long we'll be able to do this. And so Chalk is one of our great sponsors. They've been a a big help, a big aid in keeping us going. And if you uh, get your stuff there, I promise that you will not be let down. You're going to love it. Uh, They will also have some products as well uh, at the event. So there'll be some free Chalk giveaways at the event. Um, So head over to Chalk.com. Use that promo code uh, J50 to get 50% off. Uh, use the promo code J53LIFE, which is in the show description, to get 53% off your recurring subscription. So you don't have to keep putting all that information in uh, every month. It'll just automatically do it for you. Again, they're a great red pill-based, Austin-based company. And if you know if they're supporting us, you know they're good, right? So again, support them to support me. It's a 360 win, as Lord Voldemort says. Mm-hmm. So participate in that 360 win. Um, DC Customs says, I cannot leave for $10 without a Nick Cage impression. I'm trying to think of what. Do Nick Cage doing Elvis. Do Nick Cage singing Elvis. Love me, love me tender, love me true, never let me go. How's it go? Is that good? I don't remember the rest of the lyrics, but that actually sounded like Nick Cage right there, yeah, I have yeah. to say. Uh, also forgot ten dollars. Do Boomer Garcia? Well, you know, man, uh, I once was on a DMT Vision Quest uh, after Nam, and uh, you know, I saw Elvis. You know, he was supposed to be in Vegas, but uh, I saw him in the sky over Nam, Nam, uh, and nobody, ain't nobody, could tell me it wasn't him. That's good. Yeah. 
Uh, if you would hit like and share again, guys, may, be sure and make your way out to the event. I mean, this is going to be a lot of fun. It's a wild, it's going to be a wild time. Uh, what is that? My your shoe. Creatures in the other room? Oh, your My shoe. shoe okay. So we got creatures in there. We got cryptos, cryptids in there. We got a dang chupacabra in the house running wild. Who knows? CERN has opened up portals to where chupacabras, Bigfoot, and Elvis are all alive and real now. So uh, head on over to the event. Reserve your tickets three weeks from now. Nashville. It's going to be a lot of fun. God bless everybody. Have a good night.